verse 12. It's the resurrection story from Luke's gospel. And actually it picks up before the resurrection to set the scene of what they experienced on that uh, wonderful day. Listen now to, to the word of God. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour when the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, feeding their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council and a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in the stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. And on the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. That was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women who had told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be full of Easter resurrection joy as we share your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On Friday and Saturday, there was darkness over the earth, literally and figuratively. There. The, the, the passage here records that it had clouded over so heavenly it was almost like evening time as uh, the, the weight of the world fell down upon Jesus upon that cross. It showed God's displeasure and symbolized the Son of God in experiencing and absorbing all the evil that this world has as he hung there on the hill in Jerusalem. And it was dark spiritually and figuratively as well. Uh, death, it seemed to be the final answer over the whole world at this time that a righteous man of God would be exterminated in such brutal fashion as this. It seemed like cruelty and power win the day and that Caesar and corrupt government was what really had the upper hand and that that was all that mattered. Might made right, and anybody who opposed it would pay the ultimate price. Looked like Satan had won, too. The evil and corruption and the decay of this world was all that was there. Satan wins, and everybody else wins on Friday and Saturday, or so it seems. But the good news that we share today is that on Sunday morning, all this changed and was gone. Mary Magdalene and the other women creeped to the tomb, their hearts aching with grief over their beloved master and Lord who had been so cruelly executed and tossed aside uh, like a common thief. They wanted to pay one last moment of respect with him and prepare the body as much as they could before its final decay. And as they creep up, they wonder who's going to move that big stone that was sealing the tomb so that they could have access to it. 
But as they get there, they look up and see that that stone had been rolled back and tossed aside. And all heaven breaks loose as they peer into the tomb and look and see at the wonder of what God had done. There they meet angels appearing in dazzling raiment who tell them, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? You seek Jesus of Nazareth. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Go to Galilee, and there you will find him. And of course, they are totally astounded by what's happening uh, around them. They are looking into the turning, pivotal point of human history where we move from darkness and decay and this reign of Satan and the fallen world to the victorious reign of Christ and the new kingdom of God breaking loose. They were the eyewitnesses to this. And so fear and joy and astonishment and wonder and, uh, and all sorts of emotions runs through their minds at this time. What do they do? Uh, they, they look at each other and then they run back and for a few minutes they probably don't share it with anybody. Then they go and tell the 11 remaining disciples and the other folks gathered with them and share, we have seen the Lord. He is alive. He is risen as he said. Of course, what did the others do at that point? Did they take him seriously? Nah. They blow them off as hysterical, silly women at this point and don't take them seriously at all. Now, Jane... Uh, John and Peter uh, run to the tomb and look in and see that everything is like the women said. The body's not there, just the cloth left behind. And they wonder what has happened. And Luke's gospel goes on to unfold where Jesus meets two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they eventually come to see that this is the risen Lord. And then finally after that, he comes back and appears with the, the eleven and the others gathered with him. And they see for sure that he truly is the risen Lord that he has overcome sin and death, and God has vindicated all that Jesus said and did prior to this in his earthly ministry, so that it is truly God's presence and God's message for the world. We share all this today. See, uh, it's good news. Jesus is now Lord and Master, not Caesar or Satan or any other corrupt power. Jesus alone is worthy of worship and praise. He has overcome sin and death in human history, and we should follow him. His commands are the words of life. We keep them for our own benefit and we ignore them at our spiritual peril. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him and we find peace and life in Him. Easter has another message. It's God's word of love for you as an individual. It has a universal message for the whole world, but it also impacts each and every one of us individually. Jesus was there with you on his mind. When Jesus saw that it was either the cross or losing each one of God's precious children in this creation, including each and every one of you, Jesus had to make a choice. And for each and every one of you, and for me, he made the choice of receiving the nails. That he loved us so much that thought of eternity without us was not something that he would countenance, but that he would go to the cross and pay the price for your sins and for mine so that they would be wiped away and we can find joy and eternal life through him. So the good news is your sins are wiped away and over and done and the sweat slate is completely clean now. Whatever accumulated spiritual garbage you have in your life, if you confess it to him and say, Lord Jesus, take it, it will be lifted from you. Your eternal destiny is set for God's great heavenly kingdom, and nothing in this world can take it away. The only thing that can mess that up is you turning away from Jesus, but neither height nor depth nor things to come nor things uh, that have been our angels, powers, principalities, nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. So it is there, and it is for you. That's because you are of infinite worth to your Father in heaven. And he is willing to give the life of his only begotten son so that he may adopt you as his earthly physical son and daughter back into his kingdom. This raises a big question for us today. Will you live for Jesus? Will each of us live for him? Jesus died for you in public. Will you live for him in public? It's easy to say, oh, Jesus, we'll love you and follow you when we're in the privacy of our own home, and it doesn't really require much of us. But will we get out and do 
the daily things that He wants us to do, to come and to worship and to grow and study and serve and, and do the light, uh, uh, share the light and love of His kingdom all around the world. That's the question Easter places upon us at this time. Jesus gave His all for you and conquered sin and death and other things so that you would never have to bear these burdens. And these are things that you could never wipe away yourselves. All He asks is for you to come and to follow Him and to keep His commands and to stand up for Him when the world resists. Is that too much to ask? Well, if Easter is something that's important to you, let me ask you to do something to demonstrate that. And that's a very simple thing. I ask you to make a commitment to show up in church, here or some other house of worship, for the next four weeks. To make a commitment, Lord, I'm going to be with you each and every Lord's Day for the next few weeks. And the point of this is to become ingrained in your system so that it becomes part of your regular life and habit. Jesus met weekly with his Lord, his Heavenly Father, in the synagogues of his time. He wants us to do the same, to come and draw peace and joy from Him. I bet if you do it four weeks in a row, you'll find that this is a habit that you want to continue and go from here. So burn it into your schedule and make it a habit of your heart. That would bring more joy and satisfaction to your Savior than anything else you could do because that would demonstrate your love for Him, your gratitude, your appreciation for all that He gave to you so that you can live as His son or daughter eternity. Thanks be to God for his gift of joy and resurrection life and that we have the, the peace and opportunity to walk with Jesus each and every day. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to overcome our frailties and our weaknesses that uh, sometimes lead us to cast you aside and not take you as seriously as we should. Lift us up and help us to live with full Easter resurrection joy. Not this week, but next week and the week after that and the week after that and for the next remaining however many weeks there are in 2016, Lord. That way we will show that you are our master and that you live and reign in this world and live in our lives uh, and shine for all to see. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Will help us respond as your eager disciples. In your name we pray. Amen.